Hello, good morning. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm here again. <laughs> um, I'm Cathy Jerez. I am the coordinator of the um, uh, University of Barcelona Refugee Support Program. Uh, yesterday, I was speaking about the experience of the uh, Refugee Support Program, and today, I will be speaking about social inclusion at higher education and the experience of the University of Barcelona. Um, uh, actually, I, I am not the expert in that kind of questions, so sorry. The expert is our, our vice rector, our student's vice rector, Dr. Amelia Diaz, but, but she had some problems with her agenda and he can't come, so I'm here representing the University of Barcelona, so sorry if I cannot go deeper in, in the issues of social inclusion, but I will do my best. So uh, I will talk about social inclusion with a perspective of human rights. When we are working on human inclusion, we are working on human rights to education, equality, and non-discrimination. And the University of Barcelona is trying to do this within the framework of the Agenda 2030. So this is the first, the first step. So I, my speech will have two parts. The first one is an overview of the initiatives that we are carrying out. And the second one is a reflection in one of these initiatives. So we have defined six, six target groups. Here we have the first one is the uh, students with disabilities and special needs, special educational needs. This is the first group that the University of Barcelona is, is supporting. There are two programs. The first one is the, this one, FEMBIA, addressed to students with disabilities. And uh, the second one is the program Avanza, that is addressed to people with specific uh, educational needs. As you can see here, around 800 students took part of this program in the, in the past year, academic year, and around 112 students made use of the program Avanza. So this kind, these specific educational needs students are very new at the university. 112, it's a good number of people, and we are trying to handle, okay, this situation. Sometimes it's very difficult for teachers to know how to treat or how to address to these students because they required some specific conditions to study or to be at class, for example. And this is a big challenge for teachers and as well for the other students that are supporting them. The objective, as always in that kind of uh, programs, is to promote equal opportunities. With this program, FEMBIA, uh, with the students with disabilities, there are um, agreements with the ONCE, is the, uh, the national, the Spanish National Organization for Blind People. And this organization is providing some support materials for, for the study for blind students. But we are working on this, um, the, uh, the uh, area of the University of Barcelona that is working on, on the both programs is the student support service. And it's a key support service within the university. I will uh, speak uh, about them because we want to give them more importance. We have here another issue. I don't know if your universities are considering this group of people, but they are, I don't know, uh, they, are, they are having a visibility socially. They are transgender and transsexual students. Uh, the action at the University of Barcelona is something that yesterday uh, somebody talked about. It's a non-economical action. This action doesn't cost money. It's, la it's something so easy. It's like if you have a student list, 
just to put a nickname, the nickname that the person feels right with it, to this list. So if you have a transgender, a transsexual student, and in the DNI says that he is, for example, Manuel, but she feels Maria, at the student's list will appear Maria. And this facilitates a lot, a lot, his life or her life. So we are talking about a thing that is very easy, very easy to do. So this is a thing that the University of Barcelona is doing right now. The, the Polytechnic University of Catalonia did it before us. And I think that this is something that we can commonly do at our universities. This has been implemented since September 2016 by the Equality Unit and the Commission for Equality at the University of Barcelona. And I think this is like a big step for this, for this uh, target group. This is really an integrating measure. I mean, do you, I don't know if you agree, but this helps a lot to integrate 100% the people into the classroom, into all the activities of, of the student community. We have the uh, refugee support program addressed to refugee students. I talked about it yesterday. Uh, it's coordinated by the Solidarity Foundation. Has an holistic, a holistic approach. I mean, it's not only to study, it's about to learn languages, it's about to legal assistance, health assistance. And we are trying to work in a network of uh, services at the University of Barcelona, the level of the University of Barcelona. And we are trying to work with NGOs and public administration in order to assure the sustainability of the action. But I will, I'm going to talk more about the challenges of this program uh, after. Uh, we have also another group, the socioeconomically disadvantaged students. There is a very interesting program called Prometheus. Uh, the aim of the project, this project Prometheus, is to increase the number of uh, students from secondary, secondary educational centers located in the Raval. The Raval is one of the poorest districts in Barcelona. Well, to enroll, sorry for this, to enroll at the university. In these districts, the uh, percentage of migrant population is very high. And Zara, I have to tell you that your experience touched me a lot because your experience is like the experience of hundreds of migrants, teenagers that want to go further, but the assistant says no. And this program is trying to say, okay, yes, like as institutions we are ready and we want to embrace you and we are going to support you step by step. So thank you very much for your intervention of yesterday. It was fine because uh, the, the uh, facts are that these students that arrive to, to high school sometimes have difficulties, economically difficult, economical difficulties to, to go further because their families need their economical support. And maybe they are the potential first member of the family to go to the university. And some families say, why? Is it necessary to go to the university? I don't know if you, if you agree with this vision. And there are a lot of obstacles. I mean, your representation of the obstacles were very, very clear to understand how these teenagers right now in Barcelona are feeling and how the institutions are trying to, to help them in order to achieve this, you know, this, this result that it's not only to go and enter at the university, it's more than this, it's succeed, succeed at the university level. So there is the Barcelona City Council involved, there are NGOs and there are four 
public universities involved, the Autonomous University of Barcelona, the Polytechnic University of Catalonia, the Pompeu Fabra and the University of Barcelona. So they are the, the main four universities. And uh, there are different faculties of the University of Barcelona involved and the Solidarity Foundation as well. So among other measures, the project includes uh, a school tutoring during the two years of the high school and then a peer, a peer support once they have arrived at the university. So we are working step by step, but we are in this way. Okay, we have another, another target are the students with difficulties to unforeseen circumstances. Uh, circumstances sorry. Uh, as you know, uh, the crisis is, is still now very deep. Families are suffering a lot and people, students cannot continue with their studies because of this economical difficulties. So the University of Barcelona has created the, this kind of scholarships. The money comes from the own university and here you have the numbers. So here you can have an overview about the needs that students have. We are talking about more than 13,000, 13,000 students that have re received payment facilities. We are talking about a huge percentage of this seven, almost 7,000, 70,000 students of the University of Barcelona. So you can reach here how deep is the crisis in, in Catalonia. We have also four calls, um, calls for new access, uh, scholarships for new access. One was granted for repeated subjects, for unforeseen circumstances, 143 applications, and 66 uh, grants and support for training in foreign language. This is the main, the main core of this program with 366, 366 applications and almost 300 approved. So this is a big effort, economically effort that the University of Barcelona is doing in order to support people who are, you know, um, suffering this crisis. And last but not least, we, women. <laughs> I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm wrong, but 80, 90% of the people in this room are women. <laughs> so we, I can see we women. Uh, if we talk about social inclusion, we cannot forget women, not still. So not yet, sorry. Uh, these are um, numbers from a study <coughs> did 10 years ago at the University of Barcelona. 10 years ago, okay? This column is for women, this column is for men, and, this, and the graphic indicates how the, the evolution in terms of students um, people who the with the degree, scholarships, doctorships, uh, teachers, and professors. And you can see in pink women and in blue men. And this, like, this is like a size source graphic. There are a lot of women <coughs> students studying at the university, but at least teaching like professors, here you have the percentage, is around 19.19%. But the evolution in men is absolutely different. This, this was the picture 10 years ago. The pictures, the picture right now is the same. It's exactly the same picture. So, yes, an absolute yes. There are a lot of things to do. This is the picture for the University of Barcelona, but it's not too different from the picture of, 
other universities. I don't know if you can think in your own institutions. So it's true that there is a quality unit, there is a commission <coughs> for equality, there are commissions for each faculty, but, but the numbers are here and are showing the reality. The reality is there is a big gap that we have to think on women when we talk about social inclusions, inclusion, because sometimes it's like, no, no, we are equal on the paper, but yeah, on the paper, everybody is equal. But the professors who get new students as professor, teacher, they, they choose men. They, they are men that choose young men. That is the point. That is, that is one of the points. It's not a unique point, but it's one of them. Um, there is another point, is how the structure of, of um, to get points, to gain points for, for the, uh, the professor. It's very reluctant to introduce things like maternity, for example. If you get pregnant, and half a child, it's like your career has stopped completely, completely. And you cannot run again from the same point, okay? So there are a lot of things we have to change and we have to consider when we talk about social inclusion, women. We cannot forget women. And obviously, we can talk a lot because I think this is uh, an important point, but at the end of the day, this is the picture. So please, in your projects, okay. if you talk about groups, include women in these in this groups. Okay. Um, I want to talk about uh, the diversity <coughs> program and the lessons we have learned and the program, if you want to talk about, I don't know if is it's better to go at the end or if you want to ask questions or, uh, well, maybe before the lessons learn, if you want to ask questions about these groups, the tar these target groups and the uh, inclusion activities that the University of Barcelona is doing, you can ask and I can answer and then I can move to the lessons learned, if you want. So, there is a question there? Um, at the university? Um, Where, so I think everybody can hear me. Does it work? Or oh. Ah. Okay. <laughs> it's for record purposes. Okay, some gymnastics. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, my question was for the women. Yeah. Um, yeah. Did the university already um, do some steps meeting uh, the arguments that you say for instance, that some, uh, if a woman decides uh, for maternity, for to leave the career for some years to care for family, uh, are there steps uh, by the university to help them come back and at least start where they stopped, or help them to to um, come closer to the males who had, who made career just career uh, in the meantime? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think that the, the, um, the roots of the problem are clear, but we, or at least the institution, has not the proper answers or has not the proper strategy to try to, you know, uh, fix the problem. Um, if you see the board of the University of Barcelona or if you see the board of your own institutions, maybe you will find the answer there. More questions? Yeah. Yeah. I would like to know just more about the, uh, for, uh, uh, just a very short question. I would like to know something more about the Promotis project. Mm -hmm. You were saying that there were a lot of obstacles there. If it is possible to see the slide again. Can and you repeat, you, please? Could you tell me a bit more about this yeah, Promotis the Prom project? Yeah. The project uh, Prometheus was launched two years ago. Uh, yes, around two years ago. And the, uh, 
there are at least in the, at the University of Barcelona, I can give you numbers from the University of Barcelona, not for the overall. Uh, there are at least 17, <coughs> 17, one, seven um, people participating in this, in this program. Students from the University of Barcelona go to high schools and, you know, um, give uh, support to secondary students in order to, I don't know, increase their knowledge of maths or the social science or everything and introduce them as well in the world of the university, okay? Because sometimes for some, for some students, the university is like, wow, uh, I don't know, Norway, it's far away from their minds. They don't think, as Sara, Sara told us, sorry <laughs> for, for, uh, for your example, for the use of your example. They are very far away mentally from the university. Nobody has told them, okay, you can do it. Au contraire, people say, you don't, you don't have, why? You don't need, okay? So if, if uh, university students share time with these secondary students, they can help us to think in a different way about their future. They can open their minds to a new future and as well to a new social and economical conditions. But it's very hard because the family and the social environment play against these students. But we are trying to, to help them in this first pre-university stage. And then once they are at the university, there are groups of students university students that help these newcoming students because the first semester is devastating, <coughs> okay? The dropout at the first semester is very high. Especially, uh, I, can, I can say, for example, that in, uh, in informatic engineering or math, the, uh, the dropout is 40, 50, 60 percent. And there is a need that people help those students and say, okay, I went, I went through this me myself and now I am here in the third course. You can do it. I can help you. There is a tutor that can help you. The institution can help you, can support you. You have to walk your way. But there are a lot of people you know, making this way not easier for you, but supporting you. And this is more or less the philosophy of this project. It's very new, only two years, but two years and it's concentrated in one of the districts of the city, okay? But we think that it's the right way to include uh, people who in other circumstances couldn't think in this option. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but not only. Um, there is a thought there, okay, but not yet implemented to support them economically as well because family need this income and it requires a lot of agreements where we get the money, but the, uh, the, the thought is that these people that, can, that come to the university can receive like a scholarship and gain some money for, for a semester, a year. But this is something like it's right now a thought, not a reality. But it's about support, tutorial action plans, and peer support, yeah. <laughs> and I, will, I, want, I would like to stress that this is something common between university, city council, municipality, and NGOs, working together, and the students, obviously, and the schools, working together to achieve this main objective. Mm -hmm. uh, Kathy, and uh, maybe Sarah can actually say yes, from because her experience, <laughs> you see, because 
Because if you are saying that really the families, your community mm -hmm. is against this kind of thing, the, do you think that it should be some work done at that level <coughs> also? Is anything done here in Spain, in Finland, or in other places? Because maybe that is where you we need to attack. <laughs> because it's where it's one of the um, one of the, the factors, <laughs> but it's not. The, the only main. one. No, the main, I think that emotionally it's very important to receive the support of your family. You need it. Yeah. We are not machines. I mean, the emotional factor is very important. But yes, actually, there is not a work with families. Maybe we need it. Maybe it's something we, maybe we can. Perfect. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. yeah. I always think about Yeah. <laughs> I can see it. I can see it. <laughs> yeah. Maybe Zara can, can explain something about, I don't know, no, because you know the... Uh, <coughs> well, we have to, yeah, I can, I can. Because I love the involving thing. The main thing in our community, for example, if I'm thinking Iraqi community, it's important for us to involve all the community to explain them why the education is so important and how it's so different, the system is so different in Iraq and in Finland. Mm -hmm. For example, teacher work is so, so much different. I was shocked when you said yes. that you were yes. like naughty. Yes, 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 okay. exactly, exactly. Because in Iraq, they re really don't respect teachers and the payment is, the salary is so low. It's like, it's incredible. yes, yes, so we, exactly, we have to involve the whole community to explain them about the education system, to explain about everything how the immigrant youth can really um, build a future in Finland, in Spain, in everywhere. Like, how to build, because they, my parents and my family, they were really thinking that, no, you are not going to build a future in Finland. That's impossible, because Finnish community is not really accepting you there. So you have to build the, your future and plan the future back in Iraq, yeah. so don't Waste your time, don't educate yourself, don't really waste your time there. Just go to work, get the money, and let's go back and build ah. the house. Yeah. At home. Yes, yes, exactly, because they think the home is there, but my home was in Finland. Mm -hmm. I felt that that's my home, yeah. and it's still my home. Yeah. So, yes, let's involve the whole community. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And it's the, your intervention, um, it's important because it gives you to another issue is the identity. Yes. Yeah, because when we are working with with uh, migrant, even second generations of migrants, we are talking about <coughs> identities. Yes. Because some of them are in in a, a, a land that is like it's not mine, but it's not. It's like it's it's so difficult to explain that you don't belong to anywhere, yes. and more of the kids are in this situation. They don't feel Spanish or they don't feel Catalan, but they don't feel Afghan. They don't know how to feel or where to feel because there is a mix. But this is an opportunity, it's not something we have to... There is this pressure from everywhere. Yeah. No? yeah. Yes, yes. It's, it's from everywhere, really. Yeah. It's, it's like I'm not living in Iraq, but the pressure is also from there. Yeah. And it's from Finland. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. from my family. So I'm really in pressure from yeah. everywhere. That picture, I, the yes. picture you put, yes, exactly, it, it, it's, it's, yeah, yes. it's exactly the yeah. picture that th those, guy, those kids those kids are suffering right now in the 20th century, in 2018, in Barcelona. Come on. Yes, come on. Revolution. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. No, I just wanted to say that um, I think by the time these kids, whatever, young people, are 18, it's really too late. No. We should be, well, it's never too late. Okay. I mean, it's never too late. <laughs> Sorry but, for mean, the spontaneous. No, 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 you're right. It's never too late. I, mean, I said yesterday I did my degree when I was 36. It's never too late. <laughs> <laughs> I, go, I won't go into that. But uh, 
What I'm saying is, I think we did a, quite a lot of research yeah. some years ago now, but by the time the young people are 14, you begin to lose them because uh, they begin to think about leaving school and getting a job uh, rather than the notion, as you said, that you know, the, it's not on the horizon, it's not the habitus, it's not yeah. the... Um, and so we, we did a lot of work trying to work with families with young children, even in primary school, yeah. you know, trying with the parents and the family and the children trying to get them to raise their aspirations. Yeah. And at the same time, with the primary school teachers, trying to raise the aspiration of the teachers for the children. Absolutely. So that it, the earlier you can start with raising aspirations and having teachers who make different kinds of assumptions about the future of these children. You know, don't assume that they're going to be you know, manual laborers on casual contracts for the rest of their life. But kind of underpin your, your teaching with an assumption that they can, uh, they can get to university. Yeah. And so to change those kind of aspirations, the younger you can do that, the more powerful they can be. And if you can do it with the children and the families, then you can build towards, obviously if they come in at the age of 18, you, you can't do that. But the, the, the children who are there um, from a very young age, I think the earlier we can start, the better. Yeah, I agree. I completely agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. I can say anything. <laughs> you are right. You are right. Yeah. So, anything else? Is there is. Thank you. I am Lucille from Portugal. And uh, I wonder if you have the opposite situation, which is uh, students coming to the university sent by their families to yeah. make an extreme effort to have the money to put them to study at the university and told them you are not coming home without a degree and they do have to go home. I mean, even if they feel uh, their home is where they are now, for instance in Spain or in Portugal, wherever they are studying, but they do have to go home, either for family or from political reasons, because sometimes we find some cases where international students, who actually are doing very well, but uh, their countries call them home. They have to go home. They don't have their visa renewed, and they have to go home. Do you have cases like this? I mean, how do you deal with them if, if you have them? Okay. Mm, my experience is that we have, my experience is as you, if you were yesterday, um, we have an experience of three years with refugee students. Last year we have, we had an experience uh, with Erasmus Plus students coming from Syria and Palestine and they went to stay uh, in Barcelona I can explain you more the, the situation. They, they couldn't go to come back home. Even they have finished, although, even though they have finished their studies here. We ha I haven't found the situation that, you know, uh, families are saying, no, you have to come back. Not. But this doesn't mean that the situation doesn't exist at the University of Barcelona, but you are asking about something that maybe we have to take into consideration, but the experience I have is five, six, seven Erasmus Plus uh, students coming from Syria and Palestine that they asked to the University of Barcelona, what can you do for us? Because we don't want to come back to Syria because there is a war and what can we do there? If we are male, we can, the, the army can say, okay, <laughs> you, have, you have finished your studies, come here, I give you a gun. And if you are a woman, what's your future? And at the end of the day, we say, okay, you can join the refugee program, you are welcome, 
and you will receive this scholarship and, and everything will be okay. But this was very extraordinary because of the circumstances the program had at the time. But it's true that the university, or at least the University of Barcelona, maybe we can share your, your own experiences, is facing the same problems that the society has. And we have to answer these problems. And sometimes it's like, I don't know how, because as we know, the university moves very slow. Yeah. And it's like, OK, I have a questions, and 10 years later, I, maybe I have the answer, but maybe the question has changed. <laughs> and the answer is not the answer we hope. I don't know. It's very difficult. Have you been this 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 experience you are talking about in your at your, your university? And what did you do? Sorry, because it's like I am asking the question. <laughs> when 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 uh, when the students are called home by the country, their visa is not renewed. There's nothing we can do. We try to supply. <laughs> all evidence is that they are really studying, that they have success uh, and uh, they are doing okay because apparently that's the reason to call them home. But uh, we can do nothing about it because it's, it's their country that is, it's a political situation. When it's about the families, sometimes we try to have an intervention with the families because most of the time we are receiving uh, students from Portuguese speaking countries. Ah, okay, Mozambique. Uh, so yeah. we, yeah, and Angola and East Timor. Mm. So we, we can try to, because we have people at those universities yeah. in those countries, so we try to have an intervention there. But uh, it's very <coughs> difficult because, for instance, in East Timor, <coughs> the family gets the money to send a student to Portugal. And if the student comes home with no degree, it's a shame for the family, you know. So working on that is really very hard at the university. You have to go there. And of course, this cannot be done in Iraq, in Syria, and yeah. where a war is going on. I mean, so I really understand it. There are very different perspectives. And uh, I mean, <coughs> it's very good that the project and the University of Barcelona and all these projects you are talking about are addressing these issues. Yeah. Because it's kind of like the diversity of situations that you really have. Yeah, I, I would like to talk about one thing. There is a, a question here. One, one moment. Um, we have had some situation with people that, that have come with the program and um, for, for, I don't know, a study again, economics or whatever. And we have found that this student cannot follow the, uh, yeah, the studies. And what we have observed is that there is uh, a belief, a family, be the family believes that to get the degree is the, uh, the, the door to go to the heaven, but it's not the way that the student it's, it's not her or his way. And we have advised the student that the best thing is to go to uh, vocational training. And the student has to talk to the family. And we, here we have this kind of yeah, trouble with problems with the family that thinks that the university is like, oh my God, and you are doing something inferior if you study vocational training, that kind of things. This is something that we are facing off. But we don't know exactly how to handle this situation because we think that it's also uh, a personal uh, situation and we cannot as institution, uh, yeah. But we are trying to empower the students. This is, yeah. this is something we can do, empower the student to say, OK, I have these skills. This is the situation. Maybe with a vocational training, I can get a work first. Yeah. So you are, we are facing some different situations in this, in this way. And there was a, a question here. Just a comment from okay. Um, Hungary. Although the situation is not easy politically yeah. because we are I know. 
constrained by the government what a state university can do. Uh, still, universities are very much pushed on the one hand to raise the number of international students. And many of our students come from Central Asia, Far East countries. Um, first of all, we have a special program at my university, uh, but this is again an impact of universities working and collaborating in European programs to develop uh, special uh, care for students with special needs and, dis and uh, disabilities. Mm -hmm. It's a compulsion in all Hungarian state universities to guarantee equal opportunities to students with disabilities. Yeah. So we have to show it up in our strategies and everyday uh, policies, uh, activities. Another thing is that we have a Hungarian program called Stipendium Hungaricum for foreign students, although they are not considered as migrants or refugees who can take this. But some of those who take it, they, it doesn't matter whether they have a migrant or a refugee background, but they have a state, I mean, kind of legal background that they can refer to. Mm -hmm. We have Syrian students, Palestinian students with us, and for them, or even students from Iran, but the difficulty for them is when they come to the matter that their parents, their family members cannot support their everyday stay in Hungary, uh, more and more of them may withdraw from the programs of study. We have, for example, Iranian students studi studying at the medical school, and he said he's very great, he's intellectually very good. He said, I have to return back home, there is no money and uh, financially it's difficult for my family, so yeah. I have to skip. And in this respect, I, I have learned a lot to make my university to be more socially um, supported, uh, and maybe to establish a grant system for such students. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, if I think that it's time to move forward, uh, because this question that you have ask well, this uh, comment can give me the opportunity to talk about the lessons learned. Uh, you talk about the support, the economic support for the students. You talk about this brilliant student. When we, I'm now focusing on, my, on, the, on the refugee program because this is something I didn't as they talk about uh, yesterday, uh, in the program we are not looking for uh, the excellence. It was to look for the excellence, it was like to the drain brain uh, strategy, it's not this way. We are looking for, um, for, for uh, create a safe pathway for people who are in a very, very vulnerable situation in their countries. I mean, in Syria, in Afghanistan, in Yemen, wherever, in Ukraine, Federation, Russian Federation, Egypt, wherever. But it's true that it's not enough with the free tuition. People need, people need money to eat for basic, I mean, a computer, uh, everything. So the economic support, it's very, very important. In, uh, in it's a very important effort from the university. For example, we have a, a total amount of 120 euros for each student each month, multiplied by almost 30 people. You can do your numbers. It's a huge amount of money. So the effort it's big. And this is because we are trying to create alliances with other actors because alone it's impossible to, to achieve this every year, every month. And without this money, people cannot, cannot move forward, cannot, for example, send money to their families because this is one of the worries of, of refugee, send money to their families because there, in, in war countries, there is no work. So families depend on these students. So there are a lot of things involved. And maybe when we think on scholarships, we need to think 
wider, not just the free tuition, and that's it. We need to think wider. Some lessons learned from these three years. We need the support from the rectorate, but the continuity in the support is also vital. So this is a commitment that the university as, as community has to agree. It's not only that these four years we will do this. No, no, this is a long-term project. Uh, Rome wasn't built in a day and neither a refugee program. So we are still going on. Uh, we have our problems, we have our successes, but we are building day after day the program. Why? Because we have almost 30 or more than 30 persons and each one of them are a universe of questions that every day are appearing, okay? Sometimes there are amazing surprises. You, uh, as we have talked, the university is very slow, but sometimes things are like, in six months we had a protocol for, the recogni for prior recognition in six months. This is like, wow, I haven't seen anything like this in all the years I've been working on the university approved by our legal services. I don't know if you know what it is. Legal services, like it's like, oh my, oh my God. But we have this protocol. Why have we achieved this? Because we have involved this area, uh, academic affairs, in all this process. They have lived in first person what this means. And this is important. Sometimes we, are, we have meetings no, and we can exchange words. But if people cannot experience by themselves the situations, they don't, you know, they, they don't have this kind of point that say, OK, we need to do this fast because there is a need and we need to, to handle it. So we have potential allies within the university. There are people everywhere and they want to help us. So this is something we have to take into account. And we have to take care of these alliances and these allies. Take care, feed these alliances. Okay, this is very important. Sometimes we forget this. No, we have to take care and feed them. Obviously there is room for improvement. Mm -hmm. Room, room for improvement at the institutional level, but step by step. Um, and we are trying to work w according with the Agenda 2030. I mean, migrants, refugee IDPs, in, uh, internally displaced persons are a key in, in this Agenda 2030, and we have, we have room to work in this line. This is the international line, and we can follow it. And the other lesson learned is the collaboration with NGOs. I have stressed this point, but it's vital, the collaboration with NGOs and public administration. We, as universities, can do all, all the, the, the programs, so we need to be complementary, to work together. We can work networking, you know? Uh, for me, the most important thing with this program is that the university <coughs> has a real role in the social transformation. University is an agent of change. The revolution we have been talking about, uh, it, the, the university is doing its part in this revolution, changing minds, changing behaviors, changing, I don't know, maybe structures in a step by step, but changing all the things. And I think this is something that we can be proud of. Um, in, in other level, uh, the selection process is key in the success of the program. The first year, we had a selection like, I don't know how to tell you, mm, flexible, okay, in some way. 
and we had dropouts and we had some problems. Now we know how to select the candidates. Some, it, sometimes it's very painful because we receive a lot of applications of people in a very neat situations, but the selection is very important because the um, circumstances they are accommodated, for example, they are sharing rooms, uh, three people are sharing a room, and this is a thing that people of 30, 32 that has had an independence don't, don't handle very well. And there are a lot of things People with more age is more focused in, in, in things like getting a job and not to study. So these are lessons learned and we are focused more in people of 18 to 35, 30, I 35, sorry, 25, 28 maximum. It's a permanent learning process, but it's necessary to stop and think, okay, what are we doing? And for this reason, we will do a, uh, um, an evaluation next year, the first, the first months of the, next, the, of the next week. There are two key uh, concepts that I am using all the time. The first one is creativity. The second one is flexibility. You have to be creative. creative. If you don't find the answers, just create it. Okay. Flexible, because we are dealing with human beings, with persons, with all the uh, scenarios you can imagine, and we have to be flexible. And it's a 24-7 work. It means that if something has to happen, it will happen on Fridays and weekends and holidays. <coughs> and this is the truth. So uh, maybe you would receive uh, a call Friday night. I am ill. I need to somebody <laughs> come with me to the hospital. And here you have someone in the program <laughs> going to the hospital <coughs> to one of our students because there is a pain or there is something. So it's a 24-7 work. Challenges. Um, consolidate the things we have achieved, especially the protocol of recognition of prior learning. Work harder and better in this holistic approach. We are not focused on the academic, Thing. We are focused on everything, especially in the emotional yes. thing. People come here alone, without family, and they are rebuilding their emotional ties with other people. In the, uh, in the group of people we have here right now, it's very heter heterogeneous. Heterogeneous, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yes, we have different political beliefs, we have different religious beliefs, and sometimes this is very difficult to mix, but we want to, to work hard in this kind of things and in the, you know, conflict resolution issue as well. And we are working in <coughs> the next step that is the labor integration. So we are trying to agree with, uh, with enterprises, internships and that kind of things. But this is something that takes time. Another challenge, and I think this is very important, are the expectations. There are a lot of expectations coming from students about what's their future, what, what's the, the European dream come true, what is the role of university. There are expectations from staff about students and about university. There are expectations from the university about the results of the program. There are expectations from society that thinks that all refugees are like a good human being and refugees are human beings, that's it. And uh, expectations from mass media. We have been problems with mass media that were expecting to have few interviews, few, I don't know, a lot of, of uh, I, reports and, and things. And students, when they come here, they want to be, you know, they want to be in a safe place, not to be like mm -hmm. answering questions about their feelings, about 
their behavior or, or their experience behind them. They want to look forward. And this is like, I am creating my new identity here and I can't forget <laughs> what I left behind. I need to go and look at the future. I cannot be looking all the time behind me. I want to look forward. And this is something that sometimes mass media forget, and this is something that sometimes university forgets. Well, another thing, uh, how to deal better and faster with trauma and uncertainty. Uh, trauma processes appear one year or two years after the arrival of people here. And this is something we are trying to deal with. And it's very important to take it slowly and, and calm. We have, the, um, we have the, the procedures, we have the people, but trauma requires a lot of time. And this is something we have to, to do better. Incorporate in next years more women you know women are <laughs> part of the social inclusion, and more vulnerable collectives, especially LGBTI, that are sometimes forget in these programs. Uh, incorporate the refugee topic into programs or initiatives that already exist at the university. We don't have to create the wheel. The wheel has been created <laughs> years before, and the point is to integrate them in the services that the university has already done. For example, the, the first service I told you before, this, this programs, okay? They could be included in this programs with the proper training for the, uh, for the people. And that's it. <laughs> I don't know if you have questions. It's 11, I don't know if we are out of time. But if you have questions, they are welcome. You are speechless. <laughs> it's just a comment, really. You were talking about, um, I think I heard you talk about universities as agents for change and this potential for universities to, to make a difference. I guess the Irish experience, for me, it's, a, it's, it's not that. If anything, the universities are perpetuating inequality rather than addressing it. Perpetuating the inequality. inequality. So Emmanuel was talking about the rankings and the race to the top. That's very much the focus of our university. For many people who work in our university, they're on low-paid, precarious contracts, probably better in Amazon than any university. Mm. And we fight for access and we fight for programs like this. And a lot of people in our university wish we would just go away and stop talking about this. And focus on the high achieving young students and bring in money instead. So we're very much the minority voice and it's a constant battle in our university and many very good programs, particularly one that Josephine was very involved in around supporting people with intellectual disabilities, received no backing from the university. No. And was, was well, I mean, Josephine knows more about this, but certainly, you know, the, in the long run, received very little backing from the university and it was a, a battle all the way through. So that's been our experience. Well, yeah, I don't know how to, what to say, but I think that if we can feed the good practices of the universities, the other can see, okay, we are not doing right. Maybe we can focus, we can go in this way. But obviously this is something that the, the president and its world has to, to support. And something, we are, I think we are lucky. The university person is, is lucky because the university and the, 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 the two rectors we have had are very focused on, on this social responsibility issue. But yeah, I understand that there are universities that are not experiencing this way. But maybe, and just maybe, can come another another project. Yeah. <laughs> it's like to share with you, obviously, <laughs> with everybody. <laughs>
uh, is to share experiences and try to overcome obstacles. What kind of ob obstacles are you facing? What is behind this no? It's only economic reasons or there are other reasons? Because the economic reasons, yes, they are there. But maybe we can do things with cost zero. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. So mm, I, mean, I think there are things. Yes, yeah. that's the, the yeah. So that's the, the barrier. Yeah, the yeah. But maybe we can find the way to destroy this barrier. Revolution. revolution. <laughs> I yeah, the I think the revolution is the <laughs> is the <laughs> leitmotif of, <Yes. laughs> of the seminar. Yeah. <laughs> I think there is uh, another word here. She okay. Well, uh, my voice is, uh, comes up uh, again and again, so I'm happy to hand it over to others. Um, really, I suppose the question for me was, first of all, I like the idea of the project you have where you know the students go out to the, um, to the schools. I think that's really important because I think peer-to-peer yeah. has very is effective. I don't know whether you're running research by that as well and, and evaluating it as, it as it is in process or whether, well, you know, what's the situation We there? are not doing a research yet because the, the project has only two years, but research is very important in order to document yes, yes. the... Uh, yes. <coughs> it's but important in, in order to show the importance of this action. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah and yeah. whether they work, because it seems like a very simple intervention, and it would be really interesting to know, because every, every, I suppose, country has that problem where, especially in teacher education, where a lot of people from those communities don't pursue a career in teaching and therefore have this problem of uh, a difficulty when they're in school, they have no uh, role models to work from. So peer-to-peer -peer could be a very good way of, of addressing some of that. The other thing I was interested in was the numbers that are involved in some of the programs you had. I, I think you were taking, talking about 17 students, or they seem very yeah. small. Yeah. Um, I suppose the ideal yeah, but appears very, very big, and it's like kind of going yeah. back to what Camilla has said. But I was, I was referring about the number of students from the University of Barcelona, but there are three more universities involved. Okay. But I don't have the numbers of, of oh, yeah. the old structure. Okay. But this is something, big, something small, but, but we want to, to increase. Yeah, but we prefer to start from, you know, something that we can handle easily <laughs> and not big numbers. For us, the importance is not the, um, the quantity, it's the quality. And then when we, when we know wh what we have to do, we can scale it. But at the first, at the beginning, it's better that the numbers will be something that we can deal with. And it takes, it's very time consuming. That kind of experiences are very time consuming. They require a follow up, they require a lot of people there. And step by step, <laughs> it's, the best, it's the best advice. Yeah, thank you for an inspiring um, thank presentation you. again yesterday. To I stay here. I told you how inspiring your, the work you're doing is, and, but just to follow up on her point, uh, the point Kamala just made. Yeah. Um, I want to ask how much, because I've been listening to the clear challenges that you're facing, and I hear this a lot in many other contexts when I'm there, and I have the feeling that, she said, universities, faculties, and programs like this are also complicit in the problem, because what I see is that people trying to design solutions to problems for people like me, when they don't even understand me, why don't they involve me? And I'm saying this from the practical level because in Finland, yeah. this is the biggest challenge for me and the question I challenge everyone with. I'm there, I have the expertise. They have put money into my training. Do you know what is happening? People don't even involve me in research. When they are researching about this same topic, about people like me, they end up with solutions that do not work and they feel with wasted money. And like, I'm thinking, come on, you can be a bit smarter. We have people that we've trained 
that could support this agenda. You leave them out, you fail at the end of the day, and you come back complaining about money. To top that up, I've seen universities spend money on parties. And they complain about, we don't have money to do this thing. Yeah. Are we really being humane here? For me, I don't know. So I'm sorry for putting it on you, but yeah. I think you're doing a great job. And I, this is something that we should all reflect on. Yeah, and yeah. we should, because we see it. Yeah. Mere publication, like she said, people celebrate with cakes and stuff. And like, I'm action. Publication is good. It's all about rankings. Students are suffering. And you tell me we don't have money. That we don't have money for that. So where does it balance? Where do we balance this out? Yeah. Yeah. I want to share also experience from Turkey. I'm coming okay. from Boğaziçi University, Istanbul, Turkey. And as we are all familiar, we have a, a, a migrant or refugee issue, especially uh, sourced by Syria. Uh, mm. And the number of the Syrian refugees are more than 3.5 million. I know. And uh, all together with the other countries, it is more than 4 million in yeah. Turkey. And, uh, and almost uh, 17,000 uh, of students, university students, are now enrolling in the uh, Turkish universities. Majority of them in the close by in the border area, mm -hmm. Gaziantep University, and uh, also in Istanbul there are many. Istanbul University is the second one. But we, uh, when we uh, just analyze uh, the situation, of course there is a, a big language barrier because the, uh, the teaching languages in Turkey is yes. Turkish or English or German, French. Uh, so uh, they should know first uh, to be part of the uh, community. They have to just improve their uh, Turkish uh, lessons first. But uh, on the other hand, there is another issue. Uh, there are psychological conditions are uh, yeah. very, uh, difficult. So there are lots of tragedies. Even they can start to the uh, program in the university, but then they were uh, abandoning again the university because they yeah. lost their families. Their, uh, some of them, their uh, sisters, brothers, so yeah, yeah, yeah. it's not a very uh, easy uh, situation. So uh, in the universities, what we are doing, uh, we have some mentor programs, and uh, so also psychological departments are giving uh, assistance to them. Mm -hmm. And we have also uh, counselors there. But of course, uh, those numbers of those uh, uh, persons, skilled uh, persons uh, that give, giving this assistance are not enough. And also the funds are not enough. So uh, it's a big uh, challenge. Yeah, yeah. I know that in Turkey the um, the situation is very very hard for for the locals and as well for yeah. people for who sides, yeah. yeah for both sides. And we are part of a rescue the rescue project. I don't know if I mentioned yesterday rescue project is a project that wants to create information units in different, in different uh, universities from Lebanon, Jordan, and, and um, Iraq, the, the, part, the northern part of the Kurdistan, the Iraq, uh, Duhok, I don't know if you know mm -hmm. the place. And uh, something we have noticed is that if we want to, uh, to create some kind of assistance unit, information unit or whatever, we have to to inform both sides, I mean local students and and refugee students because if not you can contribute yeah it contribute to the dis disgregation and social problems. So social cohesion can be you know yeah. uh, <coughs> problematic. But yeah in Turkey the the challenge is Big, but because of the numbers, yeah. obviously we cannot compare. We have, you know, few persons in comparison with the uh, the uh, amount of people you have there, wanting to restart their lives because people want to restart mm -hmm. because it's the only hope they have to continue living, to keep living, and the social. The psychosocial support is one of the keys for the success with the students to be, you know, emotionally stable in order to maintain their academic results or attend the classes. If you are worried or if you are sad, you cannot be at class and attend. It's like, no, because I am thinking about my brother or about the lost I have suffered. So this is one of the 
key and critical aspect that all the programs have to be uh, have to take into account this psychosocial support and we can we can do things for example we can train teachers okay in order to observe some kind of stress situations that can can, can facilitate some kind of intervention with this uh, student so I think that training can help but it's sure if you don't have enough staff to attend to to assistance it's very very hard but there is a program in the in Jarmuk University from Jordan and they are doing some kind of online psychosocial support maybe I can put in contact with them and see if something can okay, okay so thank you very much